God compares an akazu so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church but to be empty. There are many dimensions of communion in the spirit. And it's important to understand the place of communion, the place of intimacy in kingdom agenda. And the reason why we need to study it and maximize it. There are 12 dimensions of reward in eternity. I excavated that from the Bible. But there are seven of them that I, I can teach because, you know, when God shows you something in the spirit, you have to come and look for it in the scripture. If you have not found it in the scripture, you keep it aside until the Holy Ghost helps you to find it. That's when it can become safe for you to engage it and also to teach it. So I've been able to isolate seven out of the twelve dimensions of reward. And I'm going to teach that next week Sunday. But I mentioned it because intimacy is a precursor of one of the dimensions of reward that is bequeathed every overcomer in eternity. And that reward is called the glory. You know, when we get into eternity, we won't be the same. In eternity, you don't wear clothes. The garments, the robes you wear are robes of light. And the level of illumination that your life commands in eternity is a function of the measure of glory that is allocated to you. But you see, there is a protocol for accessing glory. And the protocol for accessing glory is the depth of intimacy that you can access in the realms of the spirit. That is why even when men walked in intimacy with God, one of the reactions that comes out of it are illuminations and glorifications. If you study in Matthew chapter 17, from verse 2 to 3, the Bible said, after eight days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the mountains. And he said, as he prayed, he said the fashion of his countenance was altered. His raiment began to glister. If you study Exodus chapter 33, verse 29 and 30, after Moses stayed with God for 40 days, the Bible said as he descended from that mountain, his face began to glow. So much so that they couldn't look at him because of the glory that he came with. So glory is a byproduct of intimacy. And that is why as we walk on earth, one of the molecules that must define the weight of our Christianity is the molecule of intimacy. If you don't have a relationship with God, everything you are doing is a waste. Because you have to walk with him before you walk for him. In Mark 3.14, he said he called them to be with him so that he can send them. Intimacy is more important than service. And so any Christianity that does not provoke desire for intimacy is a Christianity that will reduce the potential of your reward in eternity. Because glory is one of the rewards. Paul was speaking in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 1 and 2. In fact, going to verse 3. And Paul had a body. What was his body? He said, if it be that we are clothed, we shall not be found naked. And in verse 2 he said, for we that are in the tabernacle do groan. He said, we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is in heaven. So there is a house that we have in the spirit. In eternity is the garment that will be clothed upon. The tabernacles that we wear. He said we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed. He said for in this we groan earnestly. Our body is to see that that weight of glory comes upon us. And glory is in measures. And so the level to which you journey in intimacy is what will determine how much glory that your life can bear. This is why we need to understand intimacy because it is a precursor for glory. In Romans chapter 8 verse 17, it said we are heirs. We are heirs of God because we are joint heirs with Christ. And then he now added another layer at the end. He said if we are children, then we are heirs. And heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. He now added, he said, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. 
So at the end of time, what will determine how much glory you carry is the depth of intimacy with which and in which you walked with God while you were on, in time. So the subject of intimacy is very paramount in our Christian journey. But unfortunately, everything tries to severe our fellowship with God and our fellowship in the spirit. And so my job tonight is to show you five layers of fellowship that every one of us must have as far as communion is concerned so that we don't miss out. As I'm talking now, I'm wishing that I did a teaching on the, the rewards of eternity today. Because some things are coming to my spirit. Some things are coming. Some things are coming into my spirit. Like proximity with God. Proximity is a reward. When we go to eternity, how close you are to the throne is a reward. <laughs> it's a day that overcome shall eat of the hidden manna and they shall be established in the paradise of God forever. There are people who will sit, they will be there. There are those who will be in the cities because nations will be judged. All the nations you are seeing. That's why as the devil is planting corruption into nations, the Bible said Jesus himself teaching. He said the nations will be judged. And when nations are judged, some nations will disappear forever and ever. The way Sodom and Gomorrah disappeared. So part of the judgment of eternity is the judgment of nations. And there are nations that will not be permitted to exist in the world to come. But when nations are judged and nations are purged, those nations will be reestablished to function according to the will of the Father. Those are the nations that those who don't have the opportunity to live close in Zion will live in. Because the Bible said they that overcome, they shall give authority to rule over the nations. So there are those who will be with Christ, dwelling with him in the new Jerusalem, but they will be governors of nations. That's where the real politics will play out. This one happening now is a miniature politics. The real politics of eternity are those who will inherit nations. And there is something you need to do in order to become an inheritor of nations. He said in Revelation 21, I think verse 2, he said the street of the new Jerusalem, the trees shall be planted there. And he said the, the leaves of that tree shall be for the healing of the nations. Meanwhile, there are other people that the Bible said they shall dwell with him in the new Jerusalem. And he said there there shall be no sun. He said for he shall become the sun. So there are those who will dwell with him, coexisting with him in all eternity. And they will be bringing government and legislation to the nations. So those who don't want to serve God now, you may be saved, but you may not amount to much in Zion. You may not amount to much. So next week, I will look into that subject as well. And then the other week, I will look at the vertical journeys of the spirit. Because in this life, you travel horizontally and you also travel vertically. There are those who all their journey on earth is horizontal. They did masters, they did PhD, they went to Harvard, they bought a land. They started a business. They made exploit on earth. All of that is horizontal journey. Vertical journeys are the degrees of your transitions in the spirit. How high you have gone with God. If you read 1 John chapter 2 from verse 12. Okay, let's begin with a scripture. Ah, it says, I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. It now went further. It says, I write unto you fathers. Now, notice that fathers have one business. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. These ones went back to Zion, the origin of reality. That's their focus. They are not after exploit and impact. Their journey is to delve deeper into God. To go into the crucibles of the spirit and to excavate the things that are in the bowels of Abba. And it's on the strength of those things that they find meaning and essence. That's why when you went to heaven, John went to heaven, he saw elders. They were not doing anything. All they were doing was worshipping. They were just connecting with the throne. Just connecting with the throne. But those ones are the custodians of the secrets of God. Because they are elders because they have known him. That is from the beginning. So when John was stranded and was weeping in heaven, a strong angel told him there's no hope for men. The elders came and said, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed. So for them, it's not breaking news. They have known him. That is from the beginning. Those are vertical journeys. You find them at the highest realms of Zion. He said, "In I write unto you, young men. He said, because you have overcome the wicked one. So you see that there's a level in your life where oh, it's about exploit. 
Even the crusade, the soul willy, all the action, you travel to London, travel to Zambia, travel to Congo, you are making impact. It is vertical. Because you can do that on the strength of ambition. You can do that on the energy of the flesh. You can do that on the strength of competition. But when you start traveling vertically, the goal is purification. So that you attain perfection and you become like him that dwells in the midst of the coast of fire. And that's the journey of the fathers. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. So the reason we study intimacy is because it is one of the bases for eternal reward. Number two, the reason we study intimacy is because it is the vertical journey of life. And the vertical journey of life is what balances the horizontal journey. The horizontal journey is not useless. But the degree to which the horizontal journey is relevant is the degree to which it aligns with the vertical journey. So a man who does not have intimacy with God, his works most likely will be condemned. Because when you check those words, works, you will discover that they are born out of the flesh. That's why I say most of you will say, I cast demons out in your name. He will say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. Because you can cast out devils by revelation in the name of Jesus, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus. So he didn't say they didn't cast out demons. The miracle was not fake. The miracle was real, but it was motivated by flesh. So he called them workers of iniquity. So if you don't understand the place of intimacy, you are at risk of losing your assignment, the essence of your assignment on earth, because you won't have vertical journeys. You will not have eternal reward. And finally, the reason for intimacy is, is that intimacy is the precursor of true transformation you cannot be transformed until you begin to encounter god because you are not transformed into your best version you are transformed into his likeness in second corinthians 3 18 he said we are with open faces beholding us in the glass the glory of the lord we are changed and we are not changed into our best version we are changed into the image that we see from glory to glory as by the spirit of god and so the subject of intimacy is very important. It's one of the articles of eternal reward. It is one of the dimensions of our journey on the face of the earth. Traveling in the direction of God. And number three, it is the precursor of true transformation. If you have not seen him, if you have not encountered him, you can never be like him. Because transformation is like photocopying. When the light of God passes through your spirit, what is in the original is duplicated on the plainness of your soul so that you become like him that you have seen this is why intimacy is not just important but intimacy is a must when we speak about fellowship we are talking about communion we are talking about intimacy and every christian must be fortified with strong intimacy with god because a lot depends on it but you see when we are dealing with the subject of intimacy and you look into the scriptures you are going to discover that there are different kinds of intimacy you know many people think fellowship is coming to a church service like this one sit down and hear the word of god that is a level of fellowship and that but that's not all and some people think fellowship is all about prayer and fasting and studying that's a type of fellowship but that is not all for you to maximize fellowship in its fullness there are five dimensions of fellowship that you must have and any Christianity you practice, any message you hear, any church you attend that does not trigger this five dimension of fellowship, sir, you are just part of a social gathering. It will not amount to much as far as your destiny is concerned. And like I have listed already, you will miss out on the dimension of reward. Like I have listed already, your work with God will be shallow. And like I have listed already, your transformation will not be very genuine. And you will see over time, corruption will erupt out of you it just depends on the type of bargain that your destiny is exposed to you know they say everybody has a price it's those who are not genuinely transformed those who are genuinely transformed they don't have a price the only thing that bought them is the blood of jesus and nothing else can make them compromise and the goal of christianity is to build a texture in your spirit such that you become like mount zion that cannot be moved so tonight i want to share with you the five levels of fellowship monitor it understand it and give yourself to it these things are the things that truly define the quality of your christianity the first level of fellowship 
is the fellowship of the faith. The fellowship of the faith. The fellowship of the faith. The reason we are all gathered here today is because there is a body of revelation that we all believe in. That is why we converge. If that body of revelation is contradicted, our fellowship will have no foundation. For example, I can preach any prophetic sermon I want to preach. If I by mistake say Jesus is not Lord, then everything has scattered. That means my prophetic revelation is acceptable to the degree that it aligns with the Lordship of Christ. Because the Lordship of Christ is part of the faith. Now, this is not faith that you have towards God. This is the body of truth that defines who we are. And so the first basis of our fellowship is our acceptance of those truths. This is why when John wanted to invite the brethren to fellowship in 1 John chapter 1 from verse 1, he said that which was from the beginning. I am not coming to bring you anything new which we have heard. So every other fellowship is built upon the truths that define us as a people. And you know we are doing a series already trying to examine the things that collectively define who we are. And like I quoted for you from Luke chapter 1 when Luke wanted to write to Theophilus from verse 1 to 3 he said for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed amongst us. And he went further to say even as they delivered them unto us which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world. In verse 3 he said it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto you in order most excellent Theophilus. So you see that for many generations things may change. The mode of ministration may change. The style of manifestation may change. But these things cannot be edited. This is what governs our unity. If it is affected, our unity has been compromised. In Acts chapter 6 verse 7, the word of God began to grow. Diverse revelations. All kinds of things were happening. But the faith was kept. He said, and the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests. See the activities going on. Word of God increased. Disciples increased. But the faith was constant. A great company of the priests became obedient to the faith. The faith cannot be edited. This is what makes us Christians. And this is the basis of our unity as a people. So there is no fellowship if the faith is compromised. The apostles will fight you with doctrine if you try to con con compromise the faith. In Jude verse 3, Jude rose up aggressively fighting. Why? For the defense of the faith. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of our common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Contend for the faith which was once delivered to us by the saints. Paul was speaking in Galatians chapter 1 from verse 6 to verse 8. He said, if any man brings to you another gospel, whether he's a man or an angel, he said, let that man be cursed. So, on the basis of the faith, the apostles can fight you. He said, let that man be cursed. In fact, he repeated it. He said, and I say unto you again, if any man preach any gospel that contradicts these found foundational pillars, he said, let that man be cursed. This is why the father of the early church decided to make it a creed. And they called it the apostles' creed. So that no matter your practice, no matter the manifestation of the spirit amongst you, these ones cannot be edited. They are called the faith. Are you following this? What is the faith? I'll list it. I can't teach it because we are doing a series on it already. Number one, we believe that there is one God. And we believe that this one God manifests in in a trinity called the Godhead and I took time to explain that to you already when I was teaching and I used the illustration of water essentially speaking 
water is one substance but in manifestation or in existence water can manifest in three forms either as gas or as ice block or as liquid so you have steam you have ice block and you have water these three things is h2o in essence but in manifestation one is gas one is solid one is liquid so we believe that there is one god in essence but in manifestation we believe that it takes three different forms and those forms is the father the son and the spirit if you don't believe this truth you are not part of Christ of the of christianity and you cannot have fellowship in the spirit the second thing we believe is that the son which is the second person of the godhead co-equal and co-eternal and co-existent with the father and the spirit became flesh and dwelt amongst us that god became flesh and if that is not true then there is no hope for redemption because no other sacrifice can provide redemption the only sacrifice that qualifies to procure redemption is the blood that was without corruption and only one possesses that blood and you know according to divine canons they said without the spilling of blood the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin so for forgiveness to take place and for us to be restored back to relationship with god blood must be presented on the altar but unfortunately nobody had the blood that could provide redemption so god had to become man and that man walked amongst us as a sinless entity who carried the fullness of the righteousness of god and on the strength of substitution he took our place in sin and we took his place in righteousness so we must believe as a second canon that god became man this is why first timothy 3 16 said great is the mystery of godliness that god was manifested in the flesh the bible said if you do not believe that christ came in the flesh he said you are the antichrist so anybody who doesn't believe in the humanity of christ and the divinity of christ has no fellowship amongst us he can come here and live here for 50 years he's not part of us because the faith is what defines the foundation of our fellowship the second the third thing that defines the faith is that christ died for our sins so he didn't just become man and live the sinless life he actually died because if he did not die the penalty for sins would not have been paid for he said the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life so christ actually died paul was speaking in first corinthians 15 from verse 3 in fact if you read it from verse 1 first corinthians 15 see the way he puts it he said moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preach unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand so this is what you stand on if you don't believe this thing you are not standing on anything the gospel which i preach unto you wherein also you stand what is that gospel go to the third verse go to the third verse he said for i deliver unto you first of all that which i also receive so paul received the same truth not edited how that christ died for our sins according to the scripture so the third thing that defined the foundation of the fellowship of the faith is that you believe that christ died for our sins the fourth thing that defines the fellowship of the faith is that christ was buried because if he was not buried there won't be resurrection if he was not buried there won't be proof that he died if he was not buried you cannot enjoy separation from the world the reason you can say bye bye to the world and the world has no power over you is that the barrier of christ which you symbolically undergo in baptism is a power that separates you from the world so anybody who doesn't know the barrier of christ will struggle to depart from the world and the bible said in james 4 verse 4 that an adulterous generation is a generation that makes friends with the world this is why till today some people are christians yet they still adopt the ways of their ancestors because they don't understand that this is a fundamental canon of the faith that 
we are separated from the world. The people of my father's house know that I'm not part of any drama they do. When my other brother died, after we were grieving, took him for burial, some elders went and sat under one kola, not three. Meanwhile, I respect elders. But when it comes to matters of the faith, there's a divide. And they crossed their legs, brought some list. You bring this number of Kola Not, you bring this number of Star Lagabia, this number of Guda, and uh, just giving some very feltish and diabolic. You know, all of those things is to is to is to command your allegiance. There's no power in it. Oh. If you don't do it, what they do is that they go to the herbalist or the sorcerers that watch over customs and tradition, and that sorcerer will come and kill you. And they come to tell you that it's because you disobeyed those things. That's why it happened. It's a lie. It's a native doctor that comes to kill you. He's the gatekeeper. He's the custodian. So some of us who know, we will not bow to Caesar. And if the native doctor comes, he's in trouble. Because he will not just die, but the shrine will go on fire. I looked at them. I just laughed. When they brought it, I became angry. I didn't even follow the program again. I carried the microphone myself. And I took charge of the program. One, two, three people come and give testimonials. And two, three, four people came, gave their testimony and said, let's go to the grave. We went there, we buried him and turned back immediately. They went and coerced my father later that he must do some things. <laughs> and people are living in fear. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 said, For as much then as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he said he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that has the power over death that is the devil but see how the devil keeps men in bondage verse 15 he said and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage there are many who are subject to bondage because they don't know that when christ died and was buried we were delivered from every ordinances of man and the world that is why he said in Colossians 2 14 it say having spoiled principalities and powers he made a public show of them triumphing over them by the cross but what did he do first he first of all blotted every handwriting of ordinance that was against you see if you don't know this you can't be a Christian being a Christian is beyond I attend the church you know we have watered down Christianity and people are fighting to defend denomination somebody meets you the first thing he calls is the name of his church but he's not standing on truth and people can kill to defend the name of their church but they don't even know what they are standing on christ was buried and because of that you have the power to be separated from the world and that is not all on the third day he rose again from the dead so the life you are living now is a life beyond the grave this is why we are sure that when we leave this world we are not hopeless when we leave this world we are transiting to glory absence from the body is presence with the lord when he rose from the dead he brought us into a new economy romans chapter 6 verse 5 he said if we are risen with him then we will walk in the newness of life this is life beyond the grave and this is where the victory of the christian begins from paul speaking in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 17 he said if christ did not rise from the dead he said our preaching is our faith is vain and our preaching is empty he said if only in this life we have hope we are of all men most miserable so the fifth canon of the faith is that christ rose from the dead this is what we preach and this is the substance of the gospel and it, it still doesn't stop there christ ascended to heaven I heard recently somebody said Christ didn't ascend to heaven that he entered the disciples <laughs> God. we are in a generation of terrible heresies you know when you know too much you have a problem you want to now invent things in scripture that Christ didn't ascend that he disappeared and entered and the whole justification is Christ in you is the hope of glory so Christ disappeared and entered the believer he didn't ascend to heaven and they don't know the implication of those statements if christ does not ascend there's no calling because our callings come from the ascension in ephesians chapter 4 from verse 8 to verse 11 the bible said 
Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. If he didn't ascend, there's no apostle, there's no prophet, there's no evangelist, there's no pastor, there's no teacher. There are no ordinations except as the ascension is put in place. Because when he was leaving this world, ministry had to continue. So he brought us to represent him. So it is in the ascension that mandates and ordinations were given. If you go further, verse 9, he said, Now he that ascended was, was it, was what is it, but that he also descended first unto the lower part of the earth. In verse 10, he said, He, descend, he that descended is the same that also ascended up far above all heaven. Somebody say he disappeared and entered the believer. Why did he go? Number one, that he might feel all things. So, you know, authority is a function of height. When you are up, you have control over everything. And from that place of dominion, he now said in verse 11, that, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So ordinations came from the ascension. This is why when you find a man who is called and is still telling you that is the is the fight from his father's house that is not making him prosper, it's his ignorance that is not making him prosper. And that's why Hosea 4 6 said, My people perish for the lack of knowledge. How can you be a prophet and you say it's the forces from your father's compound? Do you know where callings came from? Callings did not come from earth, callings came from far above all heavens. You were called from yonder and the bible reiterated it clearly in case you don't know what it means by far above all heaven in ephesians 1 21 he said he seated far above principalities and powers above rulers and dominions and every name that is named and in ephesians 2 6 he said we are seated with him so we are called from the place of dominion so i don't need to go consult with anybody in my village to exercise authority and listen, if you have been here for a while, you will hear things. A prophet met me and said, Kai, God is about to use me, but I should go and fetch sand from my father's compound and bring it. And they will do all kinds of rituals. One question I ask them is, how will you pray this prayer? To show you that these things are rituals. See the prayer. They use the blood of Jesus to counsel every voice against you. They use, they use the name of the same things that are already in the gospel. That you accepted and believed that you are living. But they want to do a ritual. To use those same things. So the drama is not necessary sir. We are standing in the ascended reality. And so when I rise up and say. By my calling. I'm talking from far. Above principalities and powers. If I rise up and I say. As a believer. I use the name of Jesus. I'm talking from far. Above principalities and power. This is why this is foundational in our faith and anybody who doesn't believe these things you can be born on the altar you are not a christian and you have no fellowship you can be in church for 30 years you have no fellowship so the first level of fellowship are the truths that define who we are primarily death barrier and resurrection defines our salvation but collectively the incarnation of christ the oneness of god the dead burial resurrection and the ascension and glorification defines who we are as Christians. This is the first level of fellowship. All of us are here today because we believe these truths. If I stand up and I start telling you that Jesus was not born of a virgin, out of respect, you will lower your head, carry your Bible and walk through the back door and say the man has missed it. Because anything I'm preaching that contradicts this makes me a heretic this is the first level of fellowship and trust me you must guard yourself with these things because if you miss this one you can you will not just be deceived but you may end up in hell because you will practice things that are not consistent with the faith it is the lack of this understanding that make people go to bath in the river around 12 midnight this is the origin of giving people soap that they carry from the water to take their bath for favor how can a man who is living the resurrected reality be begging for favor? I am perfumed with the life of God. What do you mean? It is the absence of these things that make people go and touch the shoes of prophets in order to be delivered. Lie on and hold prophets, kiss their shoes in order to go forward in life. 
you don't need all of those drama sir you came from beyond the grave you were born after the grave you don't death cannot rule in your constitution except as you don't know and hear me if you don't know these things your prayers won't produce results because you will be praying to achieve what christ has already achieved we pray from the place of victory we pray from the place of understanding that's why i say put on the whole armor of god wherewith you shall be able to stand against the vice of the devil many people say they are doing warfare they end up with cancer they end up with sickness they end up with poverty because they don't know the gospel how can you do warfare he said carry the helmet of salvation carry the belt of truth carry the breastplate of righteousness carry the shield of faith carry the boot of the readiness of the gospel then the sword of the spirit which is the rema of god that is when you do warfare so if you don't understand this revelation you are not an intercessor you are not a legislator you can't do warfare you are just wasting your time this is why we must know this truth this is the foundation of fellowship the faith the fellowship of the faith every one of them believe this and this is what anchors their unity 